So my name is Diana Weimar, and the show is called Objectively Speaking. It's my first solo show, and the work in this show spans about three years. Um, a lot of the pieces began at the Vancouver Island School of Art, where I was taking a course called Art and the Language of Craft with Danielle Hogan. And that was the beginning of this practice. And then there's a piece that I finished about a week ago. So um, it's, been a, it's been interesting to see the pieces that I had packed up. Um, the process is slow. You make a piece, and then you have it, and then you write the application. And the application for exchanges was accepted um, about a year ago. So I put everything away. and then got it all back out again. And so a lot of the pieces here are from my personal collection. When I started this practice, I wanted to spend as little as I could. It was important to me to um, have a very low budget. And at the same time, I had inherited a large number of materials from my grandparents who had passed away. And though they weren't given to me to be used for art purposes, um, they had a place in my home and they were, they were taking up room and they weren't of interest to a lot of other people in the family, though they were interested in me keeping them for some reason. And I also started in Art in the Language of Craft to look at work, especially by female artists, but both male and female artists that used found objects or used personal documents. Um, or materials and referenced um, their own histories or um, narratives from different groups of people. And so I became very interested in especially clothing and text and objects and began that process using things, methods like folding and stitching and eventually I used um, beeswax a lot and was using all these different ways of taking things apart and putting them back together again. That was important to me. So um, if I found, there are two pieces here that are, uh, started out as a found piece of wood. So if I found a piece of wood, I would dry it out, I would take it apart, I would carve into it, and keep manipulating the materials until I found something that I liked. And sometimes that took a long time, and, and for each of the pieces here, there are about 17 pieces. There are probably you know, another <laughs> 50 pieces that I didn't like that I took apart because the process is, for me, was very intuitive and it took a lot of time. And sometimes a piece wouldn't really speak to me and I wouldn't know what to do with it. In fact, I would you know, actively dislike it and I would put it away. And then I would take it out later when I had learned something else or I studied something else and start to see it in reference to other pieces. So they're pieces that are part of a series and each piece sort of informed the way I made the next piece and how I felt about the next piece. Um, so maybe it's helpful to go through some of the pieces and I can show you what, what I mean by this sort of constantly evolving process. So this piece here um, is a collection of skulls and um, they were all found on the property that we had um, purchased in Victoria and part of the process of getting settled in a place was cleaning up the yard and digging through stuff, and there was indeed a lot of garbage. But we also found these skulls, and um, I kept them in my studio because I didn't, they were interesting shapes. And when I started to cut up books and take apart other materials, I went back to the skulls as a kind of canvas and was interested in the tension between. Um, refined materials like books or um, there's a lace print on, on this p particular skull. Um, these are poppy seeds. And just using different materials to communicate a kind of reading of the object. Um, you know, reading books is very comforting, but looking at a skull is not necessarily <laughs> as comforting. Um, so they, these pieces evolved over time and, and in fact the book that's been cut up in this piece is also used in numerous other pieces here. Um, and then this piece here, for example, um, I was working a lot with um, ways to communicate the passage of time and record time. So there are rings around this uh, tree, much the way there would be rings around the cross section of the stump. And this was a book about literary walks and um, different walks that you could take and how they were referenced in different stories. And I started to use the text as a kind of adhesive pulp and so I worked a lot of glue into the paper and then 
could really carve out these shapes and um, it was extremely malleable and the entire piece came together very quickly once I settled on this sort of organic mushroom-like shape. Um, and, you know, I think it's awkward sometimes to talk about these pieces because um, once I figured out what I wanted to do, I stopped thinking about it and just started making it, which is, I think, one of the wonderful things about using a language of craft is that you can go into an automatic intuitive mode and you're not rethinking every single decision you're making along the way. And um, there's something really freeing about that for me. Um, these pieces... Again, using the found objects, these were porcupine quills that a young friend brought to me. And above this piece are wasps' nests. Um, very interested in the things that are made naturally and the designs and patterns that we find in nature that I think are very hard to um, match in sort of skill and they're extremely fascinating to me. So. Um, when I started using a lot of thread in my practice, um, I could use the thread, and we'll see in the other pieces, to write and to sculpt, and then to sort of imitate um, different natural forms. One of the things that I had a lot of were bed sheets and um, they were well-worn, well-starched bed seat sheets that my grandparents slept on for decades. And I started waxing a lot of things. And so this is the cotton sheet soaked in wax and then um, wrapped around wire and left outside so that all the rust comes onto the, is imprinted into the wax. And um, then I wove, you know, I started stitching with a lot of thread. and. I think that one of the wonderful things about working with wax is that it keeps um, a texture and a shape and a color. It is very soft to work with. It smells good. And so the entire process um, of making things out of wax, this piece up here is also a wax sheet, um, gave me a, a really soft and malleable canvas to use. And especially with these smaller pieces, when I began to take things apart, there was always a tension between how much to do to a piece and how much to let the piece speak for itself. And when I found a material, like for example, this piece is made out of horsehair, when I found a material that had wonderful qualities of its own, I tried to leave it alone as much as I could. And horsehair, unlike thread, um, retains this beautiful circle when you stitch with it. it. It sort of bounces up, it has its own, it retains a, a really um, natural and beautiful shape. So using the horse hair and using all of these materials was partly a process of slowing down in my art making and seeing what, what I could do with things and, and what they would do on their own. Um, this piece here uh, was rescued from Willow's Beach originally, and what drew me to it was that it had already been aged so nicely by the sea. And I had been in my studio practice trying to create this feeling of objects worn down by time, of rust, of decay, of erosion. And this piece was nicely eroded for me, and I left it and the parking lot while I went for a run, and when I came back from my run, a young child was begging his mother to let him take it home. And, and so I had to wait and stand by until she, they left. She had convinced her son that it was junk, and then I went and scooped up my treasure. And going back to craft, um, a lot of the materials in this piece are thread and wax and moss and um, using felt, dry felt and wet felt, and trying to put some life back into this piece, encasing the cord and giving it a, a softness, um, but also suggesting that these shapes could have grown on this cord while, it, you know, while this object was underwater, and going back to some of the more organic shapes that have always impressed me. Um, in nature, on the backside, there's a kind of 
felted uh, seaweed and um, this was again an exercise for a class at Visa and the wonderful thing about the Visa environment for me was that um, there was a, as an artist starting out, there was a practice and there was a schedule and there was a, support, a supportive community and so you got to go in once a week with something that you had made that people would give you feedback for and that was really exciting and really helpful. So this piece, um, this piece on the wall here is made out of dried kelp rings and I was harvesting kelp and cutting it and slicing it and putting it out in the sun and the material changes again through this natural process, um, hardens and the salt comes out of the seaweed and these wonderful shapes and textures that I couldn't possibly have sort of manipulated. <laughs> I couldn't have ma imagined um, that the seaweed would have, kelp would have turned into those shapes. And as I was collecting and reworking a lot of the objects, I also became very interested in how to catalog natural objects. And so this is a sort of nature book in which I've embedded a lot of the things that I was collecting at this time. And working with the uh, desire to let these objects tell their own story, um, but to collect them and present them in a way that would allow us to re-examine what they were and how we, how we viewed them. And so this is a sort of scientific <laughs> encyclopedic collection of hair and shells and seeds. Um, and again, using the waxed bed sheets um, allowed objects to stick and to mold into the sheets. Wax has a wonderful way of capturing our touch and so this piece is a collection of um, all of these little tiny pieces that had been in my studio for a long time um, and these are again more of the more of the same uh, materials the lace had come from this collection of items from my grandparents and um, I've always been impressed by sea urchins and the beautiful lace pattern that exists um, naturally. And also, I think sometimes I have a curiosity about dressing up natural objects and trying to um, give them a new, a new language um, that is both independent from us but is also connected. So um, just as wrapping felt around the rusted jigsaw or putting lace on sea urchins, um, thinking about the ways in which we use materials. And that finally, um, with these pieces here, um, really came to a combination of material and process. These are all bones that have been, have gone through it a three-step waxing process and part of it is creating without the lace a wax membrane on the bone and then scraping that down soaking the wax the lace in wax reapplying the lace and then working it into the bone as closely as I can and these pieces were exceptionally uh, challenging at first because there wasn't there wasn't an obvious way to put the la the wax uh, or put the wax and the lace onto the bone and make it look like it was natural to the object but once I started using the beeswax and removing the beeswax after attaching it it became much more organic to the sh shape and I became much more confident in my ability to manipulate the lace. And it was a process of not breaking down the lace, not pressing too hard, and always a tension between keeping the material intact and, and applying it to another material. And these, this piece is somewhat similar in that um, the shells were sitting in my studio for a long time. And I love the shape, and I was using thread and other materials, and I started to see these lines and shapes. 
And so worked felt and thread into the shells and they have a beautiful contour and drew me you know, to these different kinds of outlines and shapes that we find in nature. And again, more collections and um, letting the natural objects speak for themselves in a new way. There's an especially, the colors are, are really pretty amazing when I think about it and when I look at them for a long time. Um, and so these are simply thread and felt attached to the shells. And then my practice moved to away from the objects and to textile. And these were all dresses and clothing that I had inherited when my grandparents passed away. And I was very interested in giving them a new life. I had gone to the Museum of Anthropology and I'd seen an exhibit of clothing um, worn by people who had uh, perished in the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And the clothing was displayed on a light box and lit from behind and it had an incredible um, ghost-like quality that implied memory um, and in, in reference the life, uh, the humanity of the people who had worn the objects even though the objects were quite damaged. And so I was interested in keeping a story going and, and the way in which clothing survives us and tells stories about who we were and what we wore and we can imagine, even if it's clothing we haven't worn or seen, we can imagine that a person wore it. It's something that we all have in common. And these pieces I came to view a bit as a collaboration because many of them are made by hand by somebody else. I don't know who, but somebody else had put, especially if you can see some of the detail work here, somebody else put a lot of work into these pieces before I started to put work into them. And I picked the images by going through a box of old photographs from my childhood and um, was having fun with the tension between using embroidery in a traditional decorative manner. So smocks would have been embroidered and details would have been added, but these particular images are not traditional embroidered images and certainly probably wouldn't have been applied to this clothing during the period it was worn at its peak. And it, so very quickly the clothing just became a canvas. And the fact that it was a dress or a glove or a shirt stopped mattering as much as finding ways to tell a story in thread. And thread is fascinating because it's very much like drawing and creating a composition um, with tiny lines. And each time the needle goes through the fabric, the line has two points and you have a front story and then you have behind it the back story. And so I could, I, I'm obsessed with the, the back story, though of course I wouldn't display these pieces inside out, but it's sculptural in the sense that there is a back to it. You can look and see how it's made, which to me references craft. And I think the craft can be really powerful because it, tells you the story of how it was made, but yet once something is made, it looks very hard to make because of the time that it takes to make. So there's an interesting tension. You can walk in and look at this piece and think, well, I could do that. And then you're faced with the question, well, would I do that? And would I spend my time that way? And how long would that take? I'm always asked how long my work takes, which is always an interesting question because if you walked into this room and saw a painting, you might not ask how long did that painting take you. But because we know each one of those stitches went in and out and in and out of the fabric, um, I think we're interested in the question of time. And the pictures in uh, these pieces were from my childhood, which was in northern British Columbia. And in contrast to the very genteel quality of the clothing, my childhood in northern BC was a little bit rougher. <laughs> so I was interested in the tension between what these pictures were about. This one, for, for instance, is a picture of my father tanning a hide. Um, certainly not images that would normally be on a dress of this quality or kind. But 
the objects, the dresses, went from being of great value to somebody to being held on to for, I could be a hundred years, I, I don't know, they're, they're obviously quite old and some of them are falling apart, to my doorstep and becoming a sort of burden, an object that I had to continue to preserve, though they didn't have any personal meaning. And then by stitching these photographs into the objects, the meaning and value has changed again entirely. And people will say, well, you can't possibly sell these pieces. And I think I can't possibly hold on to these pieces. <laughs> that's, not what, that's what I was stuck with in the first place. So it's interesting that the application of thread and time can completely change the meaning of the object. And yet it's still a dress, it's still an object and it's still in my family, and it's still something that I have to decide what to do with. So I don't think I've solved any, for any, any questions by turning this clothing into art, um, but maybe the question is, you know, is, is that, I mean, maybe the answer is that I was able to give this clothing a new meaning or find a way to share it. Um, I couldn't have just hung these objects in the wall and put a couple of advertisements and papers and ask people to come and look at them. But when you apply yourself and time and meaning and materials, you have something that most people will spend a minute or two looking at. Um, and objects, uh, something like objects, always present the challenge of display how to hang it, how to display it, what language to use, um, what to pay attention to and what to ignore, um, how much to think about it as clothing and how much just to think about it as materials. So I found as I was putting together this show that the closer I got to the wall, the more the clothing felt like a two-dimensional material. And the further I got away from the wall, the more it felt like clothing and it spoke the language of clothing. Um, so. It's a challenge, and I think it has to do also with the challenge of preserving these materials, um, displaying and using them, and allowing people to talk about them and explore them. The um, photographs are all enlarged. Only the photograph on the left is actual size. So it isn't exactly a technical aspect of my work, but there is always the question of how big and how to make the image and how to best um, tell the story in thread and where to place the image and, and the placement of the image and how it speaks to the original use of the clothing. So if an image is down by the bottom, it feels like a d detail. In this particular case, it's on the chest and um, in the case of working with a sweater, it's more of a process of incorporating the thread into the material because the wool is so thick, um, whereas the cotton tends to almost come apart at times. This piece was, uh, this wood, I found this wood on Fort. Um, near Fowl Bay. It had been abandoned, I think, by the Oak Bay Parks Department, or perhaps just left there. Um, but I picked it up and I started to carve with it. And I was became very interested in this seed-like shape. And so each of the seeds on the top and the side of the piece have come out of the back of the piece. So in a sense, it's the same question and the same method that I'm using with the embroidered pieces, the front and the back, um, the removal, the addition. And I was working with this piece for quite a while and at the same time I'd come upon this book that had been buried in the box of stuff that I had inherited and it had exactly the same pattern on the front. And so I started to think about books and paper and wood and how they're connected and this book is from the early 1800s and it began as a, looks like a store ledger. And then somebody else came along and cut out newspaper 
articles and poems and short stories and glued them into the book to make yet another book. And so I think of this piece as a sort of third generation, though it's a couple hundred years old. Um, this piece together is sort of the third incarnation of this book and this story. Um, it's been interesting because this particular piece of wood has started to seep and ooze and, <laughs> and crack as, as time has gone by, uh, which sort of caught me unprepared for that. But it's a good reminder that some of the materials that I'm using, though I may think they're properly aged and complete, have continued to break down. And in fact, some of the materials do continue to fade and, and become quite fragile. So this piece began at the Victoria Writers' Festival, and I was working with one of the founders of the festival on a community-based art project. And so we decided to do a banner. And before the festival began, I stitched in the 28 titles by authors in the festival. And then I brought the banner and all of my embroidery materials to the festival, and I set up a table, and. Uh, invited people to stitch in response to the prompt, what is the connection between reading and memory? And I found very quickly that people were interested in the project, but they didn't have the time to sit and to embroider, and that people were coming to the festival for a specific panel, and then they were leaving, as opposed to coming to the festival with a pass and spending two, the whole day there. Once I realized that people didn't have the time, I also realized that people were intimidated by the process of uh, embroidering. A lot of people would say, well, you know, my grandmother used to stitch, or my mother used to stitch, or I've always wanted to stitch. Um, but the only person that had a lot of confidence when faced with the materials was an eight-year-old girl who made the woodpecker right here. And in fact, she was so confident that she wouldn't let me thread the needle for her. And she sat for an hour and a half making the woodpecker. And it was interesting, of course, to see a child so fearless when so many adults had said, well, I, you know, I, I don't think I can do it, or I, I don't know how to do it. Um, but I was still very attached to the idea. <laughs> and so I went to all of the remaining lectures at the festival, which were wonderful and took a lot of notes. And I found that when people give readings, um, they speak in these beautiful sound bites and they tell stories. And so I just picked the words and the phrases that I liked and wrote them down. And then when I got home, I made up images. And for example, this was a archive of the undressed was a collection of writing about early uh, Playboy magazines, and their authors said wonderful things like, about lip gloss, they were never wrong, or when the center cannot fold. And there were all these beautiful sayings and words. Um, the writer above that wrote about her mother baking a cake, and she said, my mother prepares a cake that makes people forget. It's a cake that makes me remember. And so there were just these gems, and I recorded, I wrote them all down, I came home. Um, some of them are very specific to Victoria, um, whether it's Carol Shields or it's Ross Bay Cemetery. So I started to think about it as a kind of um, embroidery graffiti and <laughs> capturing all of these different images and ideas about Victoria. Um, somebody else had talked about when Ross Bay Cemetery, Cemetery flooded and the coffins broke loose. And there were these just wonderful, um, very specific stories, but again, um, gave you a sense of place and time. And the banner then took me about 10 months to complete on my own. And the only challenge was that I made the mistake of checking it in my luggage at one point, and the lug my luggage was lost for five days, and I had to go through the process of letting go of the banner, and, and that was an important lesson to learn, that when you, in fact, put so much time into something, um, you may not want, my husband had asked if I would start over again, I said, absolutely not. And that was an important lesson to learn about the creative process, that you get one chance to make something, I think, and you can't imagine going back to beginning it. <laughs> 
it just is too painful. Um, so I, of course, haven't checked it since. I've always mm -hmm. <laughs> carried it on with me. Um, but this piece is very, very special to me because it reflects so much of um, Victoria and the inspiration Victoria and the way that people uh, write about nature and they write about their lives and they write about their dreams in a very specific way. Um, and of course I couldn't resist putting in Alice Munro and, and I also put in little pieces of things that I listened to while I was making it and it became you know, also a reflection of the things that interested me. So the real-time recording of ideas and images using embroidery, which is, feels always very antiquated, was also interesting. It's much easier to send somebody a text of a quote you like than to stitch it. Uh, but then in stitching it, I, I got to sort of think about it a bit longer and hold that place a bit longer. So this is an 11-page sampler um, based on the work of the writer John McPhee. And he's written articles in The New Yorker about the craft of writing and was a writing teacher of mine. And when I started to make the sculptural pieces, I started to think about this course that I had taken about 20 years earlier with John McPhee. And so I went back to a lot of his writing, and it was really helpful in terms of guiding an art practice. And so. He writes things like, um, you get in your car and drive home on the way. Your mind is still knitting at the words. You think of a better way to say something, a good phrase to correct a certain problem. And I found that was very true um, in making art, that there was a certain problem and I was constantly working on, even when I wasn't actually in the studio. And so I sent him an email and asked if I could use some of his writing in a craft project and he um, gave me his blessing which is I wrote in pencil up here on top of this piece um, and he said uh, this may be the only request ever made for proofreading for proofreading stitches so it was a really wonderful moment and um, I then found the pieces that I thought were were most appropriate for the project and spent about two years um, stitching these pieces. A friend stitched the paper for me using a machine because I wanted to capture the process of taking notes. And these sheets are made, sheets of paper are made out of bed sheets, the same ones that I was talking about earlier that so many of the waxed pieces are made out of. And the three hole paper I think is something that will certainly doesn't mean very much to my children, they're too young, but for, for, for many generations it, it is a sort of scholarly um, design that brings back memories of taking notes in class and uh, in fact these are notes as well and the wonderful thing about fabric is that it um, presents more options than an actual sheet of paper so um, these pieces can be, you know, folded, they can be um, bunched up, they have a beautiful back which looks like some sort of mysterious language. And I had an opportunity over Thanksgiving to show these pieces to John McPhee and uh, I think he really enjoyed seeing them and it was... Um, a really special experience for me because he's somebody who is devoted um, so much time to his craft and to um, be able to share something in a different medium was a really exciting experience and he um, some of the pieces I I took his notes and, and made diagrams for and, and he talks about time which of course is something that I think about a lot in terms of my work and he talks about humans um, and our smallest unit of time is one second and geologists' smallest unit of time that they can really think in is a million years. And so there was a really nice sort of uh, symmetry for me in working um, with his narrative. And I haven't decided yet what to do with this piece, but 
it is, you know, at the moment it seems to belong together and, and I think it'll continue to travel together and hopefully go somewhere where people who, uh, you know, people who appreciate his work can appreciate this translation of his work.